organisms and populations which we had started with lecture one today we will move forward to lecture two to discuss about some other aspects like adaptation population etc now first to talk about what are adaptations now any attribute of an organism whether it be morphological physiological or behavioral which helps the organism to survive as also to reproduce in its own habitat that can be referred to as adaptation that means any modification that the organism brings about so that it can adjust to its environment and accordingly uh, capable of reproducing continuing its race surviving in that environment that is known as adaptation sometimes it can be physiological, sometimes it can be morphological, sometimes it can be simple behavioral uh, changes or modifications. Now, sometimes it may, or many a times also, it may lead to evolution of the species. Adaptations, sometimes when it is physiological, mostly, or morphological, it is due to uh, mutation, mutations which occurs in the genes. That leads to the uh, change in the uh, species, in the species or in the organism and provided it is able to pass on to its next generation. Now, the different aspects of adaptation, morphological, as I already to to mentioned, that there are, uh, the adaptations can be morphological, they can be behavioral or they can be physiological now let us see some few examples of morphological adaptations now in desert plants in desert plants the uh, plants they have to survive under a very low water content availability low water availability as well as very high temperature they have to withstand, withstand extreme temperature sometimes it's very cold and sometimes it's very very hot extremely hot conditions now how do these plants survive under these conditions they have very deep roots deep roots means very long roots which long and deep roots which can uh, penetrate into deep depths of the soil to uh, reach up to the underground water underground water deep under the ground water will definitely be present whatever amount it is so they have very deep roots the desert plants then mainly there is water loss due to transpiration as all of you are familiar now what happens they have thick cuticle cuticle which is a waxy layer present upon the surface above ground part of the plants they have a very thick cuticle waxy layer which will prevent transpiration or reduce the lo ex excess loss of water then mainly loss of water is through the stomata so what happens but they do need stomata if they have to photosynthesize so what happens the stomata they are sunken stomata we call them as sunken stomata they are very deep seated in the uh, uh, in the above ground parts the green parts of the plants they are very deeply placed between the cells so that they are not easily uh, 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 directly in contact with the atmosphere they will definitely gases will exchange will take place but then the loss of water will be minimized they have a special photosynthetic pathway which is known as cam crassulation acid metabolism so which enables which this particular pathway enables the stomata to remain closed during the daytime so that they can again the same thing minimize transpiration so this particular photosynthetic pathway uh, leads to closing of stomata during the daytime when there is sunlight as we all know that uh, higher the temperature more will be the transpiration so these stomata they open at night when exchange of gases actually takes place then they have furthermore reduced leaves or absence of leaves which are replaced by spines spines are tiny uh, spike-like structures 
so leaves they have uh, they are reduced to spines very tiny tiny structures pointed structures so reduced leaves same thing again no transpiration then uh, the stem they are flattened they are flattened stems through which photosynthesis takes place now why the stems are flattened so that the exposure the, they have they can have more number of stomata if they are rounded thin then what will happen the exposed surface will be lesser to um, increase the exposed surface to the sun the stems are flattened as because there is absence of leaves so these are some of the adaptations that has come upon in the xerophytic plants or the desert plants so here are some pictures of succulent these plants are also known as succulent plants so succulent xerophytes with fleshy not leaves actually these are some of them are fleshy leaves some of them are stems itself so here you can have a look then how are the animals adapted to live in the desert now a very good example of a desert animal is kangaroo rat so here you can have a picture of this kangaroo rat now kangaroo rat that it's water the scarcity of water how does it overcome that so what do they do from oxidation of fat they oxidize the fat and thereby which will help in release of water the reaction helps in release of water and thereby they meet the water requirement that is this kangaroo rat is found in the north american deserts okay so internal oxidation of its body fat where water is always released so thereby they meet their water requirement then they produce highly concentrated urine that means they hardly produce any uh, watery water that means to be released out of the body thereby also they conserve water so minimal loss of water takes place through the body so these are few adaptations that you find in desert plants as well as in desert animals then physiological adaptations physiological adaptations now the previous one we saw that was morphological adaptation that is morphology morphology they have changed their structure now physiological means like how do they uh, change the phys the physiology of the body okay so here for few here this is also morphological as well as physiological both you can see here they have small ears to reduce heat loss in the polar bears you see this then they have thick fur and thick layer of body fat to insulate from the cold it will help to insulate from the cold white fur acts as a camouflage large feet to spread the body's weight the white paws act as good paddles and snow shoes so this these are few of the uh, adaptations that you find mostly in mammals so here you can see small ears now small ears means minimal exposed surface minimal exposed surface means minimal heat loss because ears you, they cannot be all covered with fur but otherwise the rest of the body is covered with thick fur and thick body fat thick body fat which is also known as blubber this is also called as blubber okay in case of aquatic sorry in case of aquatic uh, polar animals they are it is known as blubber this body fat which will insulate it from the cold now this aspect small ears help to reduce heat loss can be explained with the help of a rule which is called as allen's rule now allen's rule states that the the smaller surface areas will reduce the heat loss through the exposed surface this is known as allen's rule now here you can see similar organisms similar organisms this is black tail jackrabbit which survives in hot dry climate they have long ears but the ones which survive in cold climate they have short ears so the exposed surface is reduced likewise this gray fox which survives in hot climate and arctic fox which survives in cold climate small ears so uh, minimal the exposed surface minimal will be the uh, heat loss and this is known as allen's rule now furthermore physiological adaptations few of the physiological adaptations for humans 
at high altitudes. Now you must all be familiar that at higher altitude, the pressure, air pressure is less. Air pressure less means less oxygen. So now what will happen, as we all know that the, the air that we breathe in, the oxygen that we breathe in, a higher pressure exists outside inside our body lower pressure so what happens we are able to that movement of oxygen takes place from the atmosphere to our body towards the body but if outside also the pressure is low inside already it's low so that that intake inhalation of oxygen will reduce and that will lead to breathing problems which actually happens at higher altitude so if, if a person moves towards the higher altitude they experience sudden uh, sickness certain symptoms which is also known as altitude sickness generally at heights greater than 3500 like say Mansarovar in uh, in tibet okay towards tibet people suffer from altitude sickness the main symptoms usually are nausea fatigue heart palpitations because they are not getting sufficient oxygen now how do they get acclimatized these people, it's not that they will die immediately. Now, how do we get acclimatized to such a situation? Now, acclimatization at higher altitude, what will happen? The uh, people who are living, existing actually in such areas, physiological adjustments take place. The effects of hypoxia. Hypoxia means that uh, un, uh, inability to take up oxygen, deficiency of oxygen. What happens? Increase in pulmonary ventilation. Increased diffusion capacity of the lung, increased ability of the tissue cells to use oxygen, increased vital capacity. So these are some of the physiological adaptations that occurs in the humans when you move towards the higher altitude. After so initially the person might experience the symptoms, but as you continue to stay there, you gradually get acclimatized to that situation. Thereby, it increases the breeding rate. And the people who are actually surviving or actually residents, inhabitants of such areas, they already have these adaptations in their body. Now, some behavioral adaptations. Now, behavioral adaptations, we can talk in terms of lizards, reptiles. Now, reptiles, what happens? These are cold-blooded animals. So, the, if the temperature is very low, then they will not be able to raise their body temperature. So what do they do? They, they will move towards an area where there is sufficient sunlight. And thereby, what will happen? They will take up the heat. If it is very hot, then what will happen? They will accordingly go to the shed and they will release the excess heat. This is behavioral adaptation. That means their movement. Then some fishes... Aquatic marine, marine organisms especially, they have to survive withstand a very high pressure underwater. So what do they have? They do not have gas filled cavities or lungs. They have deep diving marine animals which have streamlined bodies. They have high concentration of myoglobin to hold oxygen and collapsible lungs. Collapsible lungs which will help in like to keep them so that they do not have uh, that pressure of water does not affect them. So these are some of the behavioral adaptations we see in animals in marine environment. Now moving over to the next subtopic that is population. Now what is population? Population is a set of individuals of a particular species which are found in a particular geographical area and can interbreed that is known as Population. Even in lecture 1, we had discussed about population. Now, what are the different attributes of population? Now, when we talk of individual, individuals, they are born, they die. That birth and death. But in case of population, there is birth rate and death rate. Birth rate and death rate, which is the birth rate means number of new births Divided by the original population in that year. Suppose the original population was 20. Then there were new births of 5. 5 new births took place in that particular year. 
Now, what will be the birth rate? Okay, of course, the new number, total number we found to be 25 now. But then what is the birth rate? So, in order to find the birth rate, what do we do? That number of new births, 5 divided by 20 per year. So, per capita birth rate. Accordingly, per capita death rate, number of new deaths divided by original population in that particular year. This is how these are the two main attributes. That is, it is the uh, birth rate will or also it is known as natality birth rate, number of births of new individuals per unit of population per unit time. Death rate accordingly, number of loss of individuals per unit of population per unit time due to death. Then sex ratio, another attribute, an individual male or female, the individual can be male or female but a population has sex ratio. Females and males per 100 individuals of a population in a given time is known as sex ratio. I repeat, number of females and males per 100 individuals of a population in a given time. Then the fourth attribute that is age. So age, that accordingly that age distribution, percent of individuals of a given age or age group, that is known as the age distribution or age pyramid. So here we have the age pyramid. Now the according to the age distribution, population can be divided into three parts. That is pre-reproductive, Reproductive and post-reproductive. Pre-reproductive will be the small children. Reproductive, that means those who have attained sexual maturity and those who have lost the ability to reproduce, the elderly people or elderly organisms, aged organisms, they will be under post-reproductive. So now, according to the age pyramid, we can, according to the age factor, we can construct some pyramids. It's uh, against the population when it's plotted. Now, if the pre-reproductive, that means the number of young children is highest compared to the reproductive as well as the post-reproductive, then we, we can say that population has a trend, increasing trend. It is ever expanding. It is ever expanding because here you can see the, uh, the post-reproductive definitely they will die out. Then the reproductive will become the post-reproductive and the pre-reproductive will move towards the reproductive. So that when they go to reproductive, definitely their number is bigger. So they will also be producing bigger number of uh, pre-reproductive and bigger number of children, offsprings, which will be occupying the pre-reproductive phase. So this is expanding population. If the pre-reproductive and reproductive, they are equal, compared to the post-reproductive, then we can say, yes, this will be a stable population. Because if we take the ratio of 2 is to 2, that means per 2, that means a couple producing 2 children, then this population will always remain stable. Almost they will, the, the ones who are in reproductive will move towards the post-reproductive and the pre-reproductive when they move towards the post-reproductive. Then, but if the number of pre-reproductive offsprings are lesser than the reproductive ones, those who are capable of reproducing, then this will be a declining population because again, they will decrease. The number will go on decreasing. This we will call as declining population. So, as per the age pyramid, we can have three types of population that is expanding, stable and declining. Now, <coughs> population growth. Or population change. Now, population growth or population change can be measured with the help of the formula births plus immigration minus deaths plus emigra emigration. Now, birth, we already know what is birth, birth or natality. Immigration means when there is shifting of a population from one area to another area. Deaths, that is the death rate. Emigration means when there is movement of a population from one out of that particular area. That is known as emigration. So here, populations are mainly affected by four factors. Natality, which will help in increase, that is births. 
immigration when from an outside area there is movement of the population this will also lead to increase mortality that is death decreases to the population size due to death decrease due which may be predation that means other organisms are killing that particular population or senescence means aging due to aging they may die emigration when there is movement due to uh, loss to external population that means they are moving out when they're moving out so here immigration and natality they help in increasing the population mortality and emigration decrease in population so population size is mainly influenced by these two factors these four factors natality plus immigration which will help in increasing minus mortality plus emigration which will decrease the population so thereby we can measure the population size of a particular area now growth models how do population increase there are two models proposed which are known as exponential growth model and logistic growth model now if in a particular area there are unlimited supply of resources there is unlimited supply of resources food space water air whatever the organism requires it's unlimited then what will happen the population size will go on exponentially it will go on increasing it will go on increasing indefinitely when there is unlimited supply of resources such a growth model of the population is known as exponential growth but actually in nature it is not possible nothing can exist indefinitely so there will be a check when there is limit in the resources the particular area has reached the carrying capacity carrying capacity means the maximum number of individuals that can occupy a particular area that is known as carrying capacity so when the particular area has reached the carrying capacity then there will be a check in the population there will be a check in the population it will reach a point that will lead to logistic growth curve this is this is a j-shaped curve this is known as logistic growth curve now if we compare these two graphs now which seems to be more realistic even you will be able to tell it the logistic growth curve turns to be more realistic because in nature actually nothing can exist indefinitely no resources will be of indefinite always there has to be a balance the no uh, resources will be present unlimited for our use or the use of an animal so it leads to competition among the individuals and then finally who survives the fittest of the individuals will survive so the growth of a population will always be logistic after a certain period of time definitely it will uh, attain a stagnant point it cannot go on increasing forever and ever against time now some equations have been given for both of these two curves like say equation for exponential growth can be dn by dt that is change this is a differential equation dn by dt that is against time the number of population against time where b is birth rate d is death rate and n is the population size now if b minus d that means birth rate minus death rate is taken as r r is considered as intrinsic rate of natural increase the natural birth and deaths then dn by dt that is the change in population can be taken as r and that means here b minus d has been replaced by r or n t n t means population at time t after time t is taken as with in with reference to log it has been given and not e r so this is the equation for exponential growth now here you can see this is the exponential growth curve 
that is a curve a is exponential growth curve and here k is the carrying capacity carrying capacity means here if the resources are limited then the population cannot increase beyond its carrying capacity it cannot go beyond it say for example you have a box how many pebbles can you fill inside the box till it is full only then that means the resource the space is filled that will be the carrying capacity so likewise for organisms also it is applicable so b here this is the logistic growth curve the formula for or the equation dn by dt same change uh, in population is given by rn intrinsic rate of increase into or multiplied by the population size k carrying capacity population size divided by k so this gives us the change the population change of population size so this is the equation for logistic growth curve when resources are limited so here it can be asked to you which of these two growth curves are more realistic or is more realistic then always we should be saying or we will have to say the logistic growth curve because what is the reason reason is that nothing in nature can exist indefinitely so that is about the growth models so then next we will uh, move further to talk about the population interactions in lecture 3. Thank you.